Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I uh, review different products that I have, different RPG products, and uh, just give you a sense of what they are, flip through them and all that. Um, I had planned on doing another Curse of Strahd video, but we haven't played. We were gonna play, and then one of my players uh, just got busy and wasn't able to make it, and uh, so once again, we have a week without a game. Um, I don't know. It, 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 two weeks in a row, it's a bad sign. But I still think we're going to be able to get those last two sessions in before uh, Halloween, which is what I wanted to do. kind of wanted to end, you know, quote-unquote, season one um, before Halloween. So I think we'll still get it. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to do this stack of books. Now, it's actually kind of large. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. Don't worry. But uh, I have a few here. Um, just a bunch of random RPG books that I got back in the day. <laughs> and just give you guys a quick sense of what they are. Uh, I wanted to start with this one. I'm going to move these off the side. Um, I wanted to give you guys a quick sense of this one. First, uh, this is in the Valley of the Manticore, which, or through the Valley of the Manticore, uh, which is by... Um, uh, which is still... Sorry, it's still by Jacob Fleming. Um, <laughs> it's one of Jacob Fleming's uh, hex crawl or region crawls. I don't know if you guys can see, once again, those very faint... Hexes in this canyon, um, uh, but this is just the, the region map uh, of a giant canyon. Once again, the art is great, really good. I got like a jackal folk guy there, kind of a knoll-ish thing. Um, and as I already described, this is a, basically a hex crawl adventure a region crawl with a particular monster that serves as sort of the main villain. That's the Manticore himself. And he's got a collar on, which is basically like a... and increases his wisdom and, um, and intelligence to 18. So he, he's become incredibly powerful, or incredibly smart and wise, and he also has some psychic powers that go along with that. And so now he's become this real menace. He's as cruel as a Manticore usually is, but now he's very, very clever and wise. And at the, other than that, it's basically a very simple location-based uh, adventure. You've got um, some monsters, some dungeons, a few connections like the other books, and then you've got this monster that's flying around, um, causing trouble, and being a general nuisance and menace, and it's up to you to stop him, but uh, you kind of got to work your way up to him. Um, Solid Adventure. It's, a, it's the shortest of the three books. Um, this one is only 30, 39 pages. Um, and that's it. So it's the smallest of the three, but it's great. I really like it. Um, I would say in terms of my how this relates to the other two, this is my least favorite of the three, but it's still good. Uh, it's still really good, in fact. But uh, I like In the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe because I think it has the like kind of the coolest overall conflict. And I like in the Scourge of... Sorry, I should say in the Scourge of Northland, or the Scourge of Northland has the best overall conflict. Uh, in the Shadow of Tower, Silver Axe has kind of an interesting uh, location. I really like the forest, the Gem Thorn... Gem Throne? Gem Throne Wilderness. And the, the statue puzzles and things like that. I like that. This one has a really cool setting. It's Grand Canyon. It's bleak. Uh, it's desolate. But it's... Um, it's a little bit shorter, a little bit simpler... Um, I like the Manticore as a creature. It's a cool villain, but that's kind of the main thing that this has going for it is the is the creature. The rest of it is just not as good as the other two books, but I still like it a lot. I'd still recommend picking it up. All right. So that was the only adventure that I wanted to show. The other books that I have today are RPG books, uh, different kinds of RPGs. The first are two by uh, Diogo Noguera. Uh, Diogo Noguera, I think is how you say his name. Um, and... Um, it's based on the Sharp Blades and Sinister Spells system, which I think there's a second edition of it out now. I don't actually have that book. I had it in, I have it in PDF, I should say. I don't have it physically. But these are two sort of variants on that. This is his sci-fi science fantasy setting, Solar Blades and Cosmic Spells. It's the same basic system, but it's just got a lot of extra material, and it's a... Well, I'll go into this in a second. It's a big book. And then this is Dark Secrets, or Dark Streets, Streets excuse me, Dark Streets, and Darker Secrets, which is sort of like his dark uh, urban fantasy, um, H.P. Lovecraft, um, you know, 
cities with witchcraft and ghosts and werewolves and um, uh, yeah. So I'll go through this and it's it's urban fantasy basically. So, but I want to talk about this one first. Um, now he says this is a, a rules light star and sorcery game. It's a old school spirit and. There's a lot in here. If you, if you know the Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells rule set, you'll know um, there's a lot of old school influence in here, a lot of stuff from other, other books, other works. Um, this is a roll under system as its base. It uses inspiration, which it calls positive and negative dice. It has a very simple class system, which is reminiscent of, well, Shadow Dark actually I'm sure is influenced by this. Inventory system is just based on your strength. Like it has a lot of stuff that you've seen in a lot of other games. But the reason I like this book, and again, it's a really thick book. This book is um, 450 pages. Uh, so first of all, cover art is weird and kind of funny, right? You've got our hero over here riding on the back of a dinosaur thing, and there's like robo dinosaurs with muskets down below fighting uh over here you've got cyborgs and this weird like brain cyborg with sunglasses and it just looks really over the top and you know it's going for a very particular vibe but the cover is also designed to look old and frayed again these are not actually these are printed on here just like um nightmare at ragged hollow which i showed in that other video um, it's designed to look beat up like this whole thing is printed on there. It's not, I haven't mistreated the book, I promise. Um, it's designed to look old and beat up. It's the vibe it's going for. Um, it starts off with this comic, uh, which sort of gives you like a sense of tone. So the art in here is excellent. Art is really good. Um, but it's, it's very, um, how to put it? It's uh, line and ink art, it's old school, but it's also, it gives you the vibe of like third edition splat books. Third edition D and D splat books. Sometimes it's over the top and busy, and it's hard to see what's even kind of going on. Although this one in particular, I like this this one. But sometimes the art is really busy. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a little simpler. Um, sometimes it's very simple. But it all gives me the vibe of like those old third edition D and D splat books, um, which you know, I I think it's not my favorite, but it's also really good, and it certainly fits the tone of this game very, very well. So the game has basic classes. Uh, you have um, the tough, the nimble, the smart, and the gifted. And it's basically fighter, thief. Um, smart is, is more like a, a skill-based class. So you're, you're uh, getting by in this game as like an artificer, basically. You're, you're, you have gadgets and vehicles and stuff like that. But it's different for each of his different games. Uh, and then the gifted is your spellcaster. You're, in this case, basically your Jedi. One of their abilities is called I Sense a Disturbance. Um, and so the game is, you know, cosmic blades or solar blades are basically lightsabers. And it's very much influenced by Star Wars, but it's also influenced by like Alien and Mad Max. And it's just like it's a real jumble of science fiction, dystopian uh, fantasies, along with some space opera and some uh, other stuff going on in there. But the book, for the most part, is really good. And like, it's comprehensive. One of the things that I think is either an, uh, an upside or a downside, depending on how you look at it, and with 450 pages, there's just a lot of extra stuff in here that, uh, that I, I think is probably not... Not that it's bad in and of itself. It's probably useful. It is useful. But relative to the size of the book and relative to the usefulness of the particular rule that it, you know the extra five or three or four pages covers, do I need it? And, and increasingly, as I move more and more into the old school vibe, I'm less convinced of it. And, and for a game that calls itself rules light, uh, I don't I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, I, I think it is rules light in that it's rulings heavy. It's all about rulings, really. But um, he covers everything. He talks about everything, um, and and how to how he would adjudicate it and stuff like that. So you you really have. Um, like, oh, this is a good example, right? Social and intelligence challenges. How do you run a social and intelligence challenge? Language and communication and how that should play into the game. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's rules light. There's not really rules about this, but it's advice heavy. Am I going to read through this whole book and, and listen to how he tells me to run these kinds of uh, encounters? I don't know. I mean, I, I might agree with him. I might disagree with him. But that's not really why I buy a book. I don't really buy a book for advice on how to run games. Mostly, you know, you, you kind of figure out what works for you at the table, 
And then you go, if you really need to, right, there's, there's, there's lots of good blogs, lots of good advice for how to run particular kinds of games. Um, I don't know if you need to include that in a book like this. Uh, the stuff that is really valuable in here are all the random tables towards the end, but the, the, the rule system itself is a roll under system, which I'm never, I'm not really a huge fan of roll under systems, but it's done well. And there's a luck system, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, there's a push your luck system. I really like how it does attacks where you get these, you can choose to attack any number of times you want. But for every additional attack, all of your attacks that round get a minus two. So you can choose to attack five times, but then you're gonna get a minus, uh, what would that be, minus eight to every attack because you had four extra attacks. And so each is minus two to the whole. So including your first attack, you get a minus, it's not bit by bit, you say, I'm gonna attack five times and then you do it. So you get a minus eight to every attack roll, but you can do it if you want. So if you have a very high bonus or the enemy has a very low armor class or something, then you can, uh, you can, you can do it. Um, so it's a roll under system, but there's also like a ton of different rules for modifying difficulties. So in that sense, I'm not, yeah. The, how often are you actually trying to roll under your number? Very rarely. Very often it ends up being, well, I want you to have, I want this to be a hard challenge, so I'm gonna have a plus five to your roll or something like that, you know? So it, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting roll under system because it's, it kind of mimics, well, yeah, yeah. It depends on what you think of roll under systems. Um, I have my issues with them. But I've been flipping through and not really talking about what a lot of this book has. This book has just lots and lots of information about this particular kind of setting. Now it's not a particular setting. There are, uh, there's a lot of advice on, um, on what it is. But like, you know, one of the things we know is that it's a post-apocalyptic universe. Um, it's a brutal universe. Uh, technology is a wonder of the past. So it's one of these like, you know, um, uh, post-apocalyptic dystopian planet hopping settings where there's lots of planets, you're going from bit to bit, obviously influenced by things like Firefly, obviously influenced by things like Cowboy Bebop, but uh, Star Wars is in there, Star Trek is in there, Mad Max is in there, Starcraft is in there, um, Alien, uh, HP Lovecraft, um, so it's it's a really interesting setting and, and very often what he'll do is he'll give you tables for facts like how did the universe fall into chaos well here's a table of 10 entries that you can roll on or you can decide on um, or just inspiration and then there are uh, sectors that he gives you with themes associated with those sectors uh, things like, like this is the core right so the themes are mystery secret knowledge um, Etc. Things like that, and and there's different different kinds of of planets and systems that he details and has tables for kinds of encounters you might run into, adventure opportunities out there, a description of them with um, c contents there, um, uh, visions you can have, things you can, strange things you can see there, um, and it goes to the ghost sector, the machine sector, right? I mean, like. Yeah, every single kind of sector from this sort of dystopian science fiction vibe, it's all in here. The corporate, the corpo sector, right? The, the biohazard sector, all, all the basic ideas of the different kinds of sectors you can run into. It reminds me a lot of two books, actually. It reminds me a lot of a book I'm about to cover, or part of a book I'm about to cover, which is ICRPG, and the way that he covers sort of like um, Hankerin covers certain kinds of sectors in his science fiction setting in that book. And then um, it also reminds me of Stars Without Number, which is one of the influences of this book and how a huge portion of that book is random tables. And it like a, a lot of it is over, like, there's a lot of overlap between this book and The Stars Without Number by Kevin Crawford. Um, the difference is, you know, most of that stuff by Kevin Crawford's free. So like how useful, you know, I like having this book because I like the cover, I like the art, I think it's a cool book to have. I, you know, if, if you're interested in this, I would certainly recommend buying it. Um, but is it necessary? Is it like a must have? No. And I think that Kevin Crawford's book, Stars Without Number, the free version is basically does what this does. Uh, it gives you a setting, it gives you a system, it gives you tons of tables, it gives you like a whole thing to do without actually having to buy a 450 page book um, along with it. And uh, again, is the setting 
something I'm going to... Is the, is the system something I'm going to play? No, not really. Uh, I don't really like a roll under systems, and so therefore the whole... This is just not something I would do. I like this, though. It's got a bunch of different ships, right? It looks like a bunch of different spacecraft. This one's like just a face, but it's technically a ship. Um, so this book and uh, this book are similar in their system. It's the same system, basically, just modified for setting and different tables and different powers and the spellcasting powers and things like that. Uh, but it's a rules light, very simple system. I think you would find it enjoyable. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure it's, an, it's a must buy. It's, it's not something I like having them. Um, but I think I probably would have been happy with them in PDF. And, and honestly, for this one, um, I, in my mind, I mix it up constantly with Stars Without Number because the tables here are like a, a less fleshed out version of Stars Without Number. Um, but it's still good, and there are obviously differences, and some, some people might like the tone shift. It's more particular than Stars Without Number, um, but some people might not. And the system of both Stars Without Number and Solar Blades and Cosmic Spells is not my favorite. Um, but it does have a lot more old school, I would say, sensibilities than, than Stars Without Number. But it's a, it's a very similar book. Uh, this one is similar. Again, it's the same system. That's the same guy. Uh, and it's the same basic uh, way of playing. You use the same roll under system. You have the same classes. Um, this one is just dark, you know, witchcraft and creatures of the night and vampires and ghosts and um, urban fantasy stuff uh, where you're dealing with, with monsters and, and, and the, the, all that stuff. Um, but it's it's uh, it's good too. The art is good. It's definitely darker. It's definitely more um, tonally, I would say, consistent. Um you play a game like, um, like a Big Trouble Little China with this game, right? Or The Thing, or the, you know something like that out of the '80s, uh, '80s you know adventure horror movies, The Goonies, or uh, no, I should say Lost Boys or something. Um, uh, basically, the same piece of art. I think it is the same piece of art from the other book, for The Gifted. Um, sorcery powers there. It's it's obviously also also influenced by DCC. I forgot to mention that Dungeon Crawl Classics. Uh, there's like backlash systems if you fail spells. Um, there's a lot of uh, influence in the tone of, of Dungeon Crawl Classics as well, um, and a lot of the art pieces are clearly influenced by that. Um, yeah, a lot of the art in these books is shared. I'm looking through it now, and noticing that um, there's obviously a lot of unique art, but you know he I think he does a lot of it. Um, but there are a lot of artists who worked on these books. Um, it's like the Dresden Files, right? That's what a lot of this book is, is the Dresden Files. Um, again, I, would I recommend buying this? If you're, if you're, if you're going to play a, a, you know, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer game, which some people really would love, uh, if you're going to play a, you know, the Lost Boys game for Halloween or something, if you really like Roll Under Systems, um, and you're keen on sort of an old school vibe with... Um, with some flexibility in, in your actions and in pushing your luck and in uh, players being able to have some measure of control over what they do and over whether they get advantage or not. Like, you get, you, when you come up with your character concept, one of the things that you do is you say, like, you, you actually say what your character concept is and you write that down and then that will affect mechanics. So, like, uh, you might say, I'm a... Um, Oh gosh, what would be an example? I'm a uh, hard-boiled street investigator who has a checkered past. And that's going to affect your abilities. You can say, well, because I'm a hard-boiled street investigator, shouldn't I get positive dice, which is an advantage? Shouldn't I get positive dice on this sort of check? And the DM can say, sure. And it's a little bit like backgrounds in Shadow Dark or um, or anything else. Um, but it's uh, it's... Just done in a very it's a more freeform way, and it's it's broader than your background because you, it's a whole concept, and so it might have multiple things wrapped kind of wrapped in with it. Um, again, would I buy this again? As I am as a gamer today, instead of when I got it, which was a few years ago, probably not. But if you're in the mood for urban fantasy, if you like Dresden Files, if you really like um, that vibe of things. 
we were going for it for Halloween or something like that, then this would be a great book to get, at least in PDF. Um, I think it's it's good, um, solid. I mean, obviously, a lot of work went into these books, and so just from a presentation standpoint alone, they're they're really well done. But I think if you're going to do um, kind of urban fantasy, then you'd be better served doing something like this, Blades in the Dark. Now, Blades in the Dark obviously is a very different style of game. I mean, it's nothing like uh, Dark Streets and Darker Secrets. Um, because, I mean, if you know Blades in the Dark, it's just it's a very unique game system. But Blades in the Dark is another solid book. And this one is also quite big. And also very flavorful. This one's about 300 pages. Um, Blades in the Dark is, for those of you who don't know, where you play basically a, 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 a dark urban fantasy Ocean's Eleven. Right? You play a crew of thieves who's committing all these heists around this uh, steampunk, dark, gothic, horror city. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting. I think it's, 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 first of all, from presentation alone, gorgeous. Once again, you know, there's a theme amongst these books in that the art is awesome. But the art is this, and this is very particular. Um, it, it all is designed to evoke a very particular style, a very particular vibe. Um, and, and one thing I will say is that this is a very cohesive product. The art, the mechanics, the um, cartography, everything about it is unified. Um, you get this really cool piece of art there. Um, much of this book is empty of just text. There's a lot of reading if you're going to really get involved in running this system. You got 350 pages. Now these are the rules, examples, how to play, do player versus player. Um, but the, the basic idea is that you're going through um, in your uh, in your heists, stealing from the rich and probably keeping the the, the rewards yourself. Uh, this is not a it's not a setting where everybody or anybody really is good. Um, most everybody is bad. And you, but there are some really cool things about the setting. It, you pick um, the kind of gang you are. Maybe you're just thieves. Maybe you're enforcers. Maybe you're cultists uh, trying to achieve your your dark schemes. Um, and uh, each of the classes has different ways of achieving their goals. Now, one of the ways that the game gets around the Ocean's Eleven thing, where you, you know, realize the whole time that this has been part of the plan, things start to go wrong. But actually, it turns out it's been part of the plan. Is this game has a very interesting system where the players can say they can spend resources to basically say, "Oh, hey, I actually yesterday I figured this out." Right. So, like, you come up, the guard comes around the corner and surprises the the, the crew. And then one of the players uses up a, a thing and says, okay, actually, this is the guy I met in the bar yesterday and I bribed him. Okay, great. So he sees you and continues on his way. He whistles, you know. <laughs> it's sort of a collaborative story in that sense where the players get to suggest and, and use their own resources to, uh, to solve problems retroactively. Which, again, it brings about, it kind of, it kind of brings, a, uh, brings about that um, Ocean's Eleven feeling. So it works for a heist because it would be really hard to present all of the information to the crew ahead of time and have them plan a heist and then try to execute it in the ordinary sequence of things without a mechanic like that. So I really like that it's built in that way. Um, again, you can see a lot of this early part of the book is just text. And there are pieces of art in particular moments. Um, but this book is another one of those that kind of has to teach you how to play. So I guess that's one of the differences that between something like this, excuse me, something like this, and something like this, is that this book teaches you how to play, but it doesn't have to. It tells you how to do everything, when really all you need to know is you know a role under system and the basic mechanics of that. But it goes through the whole thing. So is it rules light? Well, yeah, the system is, but he, he, he spends a lot of time telling you stuff that if you're buying this book, let's be honest, you're not buying this book if you're a newbie. If you're buying this book, you've played RPGs. You know how all of these things work. So you don't need all that information. This is not going to the random, you know, randos who are just starting RPGs. They're not going to start with Solar Blades and Cosmic Spells. 
Blades in the Dark understands that. Uh, this is also a very unique game, and you, 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 it assumes you know some things already, but it also is a very different system. This is a lot of stuff that's pretty similar to other games. So it doesn't need to explain it all. This game has a lot of unique mechanics, and so it has to spend that time explaining itself uh, because it's a totally different kind of game. Um, whereas, uh, again, Solar Blades and Cosmic Spells, it's 450 pages. It could probably reasonably be 200 and still include most of the stuff that makes the book interesting, in my view. Um, okay, so again, going forward a bit, the setting here is this really cool dark city where there are these um, uh, there are these uh, creatures, ghosts, demons, things that uh, broke the world, or something broke the world, and now it's perpetually dark. And there's a very brief moment of twilight where things start to get a little brighter, but it's still all dark. And uh, there's just these vast oceans of darkness out there, and people go out there and kill monsters and bring their blood back, and it's what powers the city's lights and fuel and stuff. Duskfall is the city city guide to Duskfall. Um, and it's sort of a combination of Bruges and Venice and London and Paris and just sort of these, like, in sort of the gaslight era. It's all very dark because it's always dark. So it makes sense that you'd have kind of a thief in that setting. It's a town watchman. Uh, nobody's good, obviously. Certainly not the law and order. There are ghosts and uh, spirits. And um, here's a map of the city. There are ghosts and spirits, and you kind of have to um, uh, deal with them. Now, uh, again, you can see here the side view is very much... Venice or something um, and as you go through it's kind of like that I like how each of the sections of the city gives you a visual of just what kind of it looks like in a very stylized way um, I haven't played this game will I play this game I'm not sure but I haven't and uh, and yet is it is it uh, cool yeah totally I want to play this game but this is the sort of thing where I think I would probably play it once, like a long campaign of it, maybe like a, like you know a few months or uh, something. Play one campaign of it, and then I might be done. I mean, who knows? I might love it, but it seems like a novelty. It, it like it's such a very specific tone in terms of the setting, in terms of the um, the mechanics in terms of the, the, the kind of structure of the game, which is a heist game. It's so specific that it's not the sort of thing I would come back to over and over and over probably for many long campaigns. I might play one long campaign here. I might play some one shots in here, but it's not going to be like my go-to system because it's so specific. It's, it scratches a particular itch and it's not an itch that I feel all the time. But some people might really you know dig that system and that's what they want to play. So if, if I would recommend getting this Either way, um, again, the presentation is beautiful. That cover is gorgeous. The way the light hits him and his red eye is glowing. I just think it's a really cool cover. Uh, it gets the tone very, very well. Very good. Very good book. Um, now, a couple more. Uh, this is ICRPG. This is the second edition of ICRPG. I think there's a definitive edition that's out. This is um, a great book for so many reasons. So this is the, in, in a lot of ways, this is the exact opposite of this, and I keep dunking on this, and I shouldn't dunk on it. It's a good book, it really is. And again, you put a ton of work into it. There's a lot of good information in here. It's a good system, it's all solid, it's just not my thing. And I, I guess I do take issue with how much information he includes that I don't think is necessary. This book includes nothing but what is necessary. ICRPG, so the basic system is, first of all, incredibly simple. Um, incredibly, incredibly simple. The, the presentation is excellent. It's all done in this like notebook style. Um, and that's how, if you know Runehammer, uh, if you know Hank Renfernail, um, that's how his style is. This is just oozes him. Uh, if you like his channel, you'll like this book. Um, if you don't know his channel, you should go check it out. But uh, the system is very easy. You're talking about the very basics. Um, one of the systems I really like in this, I, this game is the effort system. So effort is basically how you deal with, it's, it's, you give hit points to every kind of task, or not every kind of task, but many kinds of tasks. And so you can roll and do 
damage, quote unquote, to different kinds of tests. So for example, you're trying to pick a lock, you roll for effort, but you roll to succeed. And if you succeed, then you roll effort. And that's how much you've succeeded, right? So say it has 10 hit points, right? 10 hit points. And uh, you succeed on your, your lock pick check, you roll a D, you roll a D6. And so you, you roll a five, okay, well, you've, you've picked five of the 10 hit points of that task, right? You've, you've put five effort into a 10 effort task. Um, you're halfway there. Uh, next time you, you pick it again, and you succeed on the roll and you only roll a three this time. So now you're eight out of 10, right? So you can kind of give, and I really like that idea. You, you quantify success beyond simple binary. I succeeded on the check or I failed on the check. You add effort to it and, and you can succeed or uh, and have degrees of success built in just the way you do with hit points. When you hit a monster, you don't kill it outright. You can, but you mostly don't. You, you make progress towards your ultimate success. And that's one of the main mechanics of this book the system gives you. There's so many different ways of thinking about it though. There's abstracted time and distance. Um, loot, all the character progression is done through loot and equipment, health, loot and equipment. Um, really just excellent in, in many ways. Again, presentation, but it's so frugal in its space. Everything is, is um, really, really efficient. His writing is, is evocative, and it leaves a lot to the imagination. And that's by design. It's my preference. He also presents two entire systems in here, Alfheim and uh, Warp Shell, two entire kinds of games, one fantasy, one sci-fi, along with worlds for each of them. Very basic bits of information about the different locations, um, but enough that you have adventures and so not only is this uh, a rule system, but it's a setting, two settings, <laughs> uh, with races attached, with equipment attached, with um, how to run games and advice for how to run games, but like really good practical advice, not just like when you're doing a, you know, a, a, a social encounter, do it this way, but like, no, we're going to program monsters in this way. We're going to create particular ways for them to to progress. We're going to give you uh, structures to use in your adventures. Uh, you can use this one or that one. You can use this other third thing to, to create a very particular kind of, of challenge. Um, encounter archetypes and the different ways that you could use them and the different kinds of challenges you could give them and why you might use them. And so it's very practical advice as opposed to kind of just um, general advice giving. It's very practical advice. The monsters in this book are awesome. Um, very, very uh, brief descriptions of the fantasy monsters, um, but enough to get you interested in using them, which is, in my opinion, a, a success. I love these. We have goblins or gerblins or goblins. Which do you want to call them? Because they're all the same. I like gerblins myself. Um, again, really, really great art. Uh, Hankren does all the art himself. Does all this writing himself, as far as and this is a work of of, of uh, passion. <laughs> and then there are adventures. At the end, he gives you a set, bunch of set adventures, both for Warp Shell and for Alfheim, and they're good adventures. Pretty straightforward, but they're good adventures. Really, would be fun to use um, on the table, and they, they get more complex as you go forward. Um, but they're 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 all pretty straightforward. Uh, set of adventures here. This one's really good. It's a gothic horror adventure, um, and it's quite scary. There's some images in here, imagery that you can, uh, that it's really horrifying. One of the things that this does, and I really like this, is it shows you that you don't, it's so easy to create your own settings in this game because the rules are so light and your, your progression is mostly equipment-based. As long as you create era-appropriate equipment, then you basically have your classes. Um, yeah, horrifying HP Lovecraft, uh, Darkest Dungeon vibe monsters. And then the back of this book is just a bunch of random tables, which I'm always a fan of. Shabby loot tables, cursed loot tables, bizarre loot tables, with some character sheets and note pages at the back. So another excellent book, ICRPG. Um, really recommend it. I think there's a better edition of it out now or a more definitive edition out now. I like this one, yeah, but it's seen some use for me. I've seen it. I've used it quite a bit. 
Finally, last but not least, we have Five Torches Deep. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time this, on this one. This might be a little bit longer than my normal videos because Five Torches Deep is, um, in my view, it's sort of like a proto Shadow Dark, or at least it's the way I thought about it. It came out a few years ago, and it, it I think it's trying to do the same thing that Shadow Dark is trying to do. It's trying to take a basic D&D &D idea, the basic six stats, D20, uh, advantage disadvantage system and simplify it and make it OSR friendly and make it easier for DMs to run and for new players to enter into and, and kind of cut off all those layers of complexity. So, uh, you know, the book, it's, it's, it's a splat book. It's very thin, but a lot of information in here. Um, the pages are well designed. The art is good. It's sort of a mix between um, 5e high fantasy and old school art. The whole book is like that. Um, you can see that even just on the front there. Got these adventurers going down into the deep. Um, but it doesn't succeed as well as Shadow Dark. And I, you know, I'm not going to go through it bit by bit and explain why I think it it, it doesn't work. I think. Basically, in a word, the reason this doesn't work as well as Shadow Dark in what it's trying to do, which is get that 5e player base into OSR games, is that, well, first of all, it doesn't have nearly the same level of random tables and flexibility and, uh, and uh, resources for you as a DM that Shadow Dark does. Shadow Dark is such a great resource that if you never ran the game, those tables, those random encounter tables, those you know, loot tables, all of that would just be treasure for years to come. So those random tables make it a valuable book even if you don't like the system. Whereas this one doesn't have that, so if you don't like the system, there's not as much reason to buy this. But one of the reasons that I think this is, it doesn't succeed as well, is that it tries to maintain a certain level of complexity in choice that goes against the idea of simplifica simplicity, simplification. I've run this and it doesn't seem to strike the proper balance between player choice and, uh, and and player expectation. You're more survivable than in 5e, or sorry, you're more survivable than in Shadow Dark, um, but you get these random characters, and so you're more likely to get stuck with, um, yeah. So I think that's the reason, one of the reasons it doesn't work, is because it has this sense of expectation uh, and execution. Players are going to kind of get locked into characters the way you get locked into characters with 5e, at least in my experience, and there isn't that much. Um, they get a lot of abilities right away, and then their progression is very slow. And uh, and that combination makes it seem like, I don't know, I think, I think 5e players are going to be disappointed if this is kind of the intention is to get 5e players into the system. It's not different enough to shake that expectation. That's been my experience. I played this for 5e players, and that was their experience. They didn't enjoy the characters very much. They didn't enjoy running them. Whereas when I run Shadow Dark for 5e players, it's it's different enough. It's significantly different enough in terms of expectations and how the how everything works that they go, oh yeah, this is a different game almost. And so I think it's just a matter of expectation. Not that the game isn't fun. I do think it's actually really good. And like I said, I when I first got this, I I think I played it uh, to death. I, I really liked it. But it didn't have longevity. You know, and it's, I've only really run one Shadow Dark campaign, so maybe Shadow Dark doesn't have longevity either. I, I'm not sure. I would imagine it does. But um, it just doesn't have the same um, hook into my players that Shadow Dark does. But I think this is a great system. And if you want to compare, if you're like interesting and interested in hacking 5e or you're interested in doing your own thing with 5e, then I think Shadow Dark and this book are both worth getting to compare. And maybe just this book alone, just to compare, like see how you would do it. Like I went through this and I was like, this is a great idea. I would just change all these things. Oh yeah, this is how they did fighters and this is how they did clerics and I think called them zealots. Awesome. Here's what I would change about the way that it's presented. Here's the way I would do spells differently. But a lot of the similar spell failure is in here. Inventory management is in here. Um, uh, this has a system for like quantum inventory, which I'm not so keen on. But other than that, um, it, it's a good system. And it is. I just, for some reason, it didn't hook my players. And I think that has to do with expectations. 
Now, maybe it's possible that it, uh, it was just that particular group of players, but it's the same group that I'm running for Shadow Dark now, and or at least some of the players are the same, and I think they're enjoying Shadow Dark more than they did enjoyed Five Torches Deep. But it's a comparable system, absolutely, and it's another kind of OSR version of 5e that you might find interesting to try. All right, well, that's uh, all of it for today. I just have a whole bunch of random RPGs. I have more, but I just grabbed them off the shelf because they were small and they were similar in size except this one. And, uh, and I thought they were worth comparing and, and going through. Anyway, um, hope you guys enjoyed it. See you around.